Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, to this webinar. It's the fifth of our uh, weekly webinars. Um, uh, my name is Eduardo Suarez. I'm the head of comms uh, at the Reuters Institute. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to uh, to be with us today. We know how busy you are, especially journalists, for keeping us informed about. Uh, this pandemic. Uh, we are really lucky today, um, as always, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Jay Scott Brennan. Um, Scott is uh, the lead author uh, of our recent fact sheet on uh, misinformation about the uh, coronavirus, how it is uh, done, how it is uh, fact checked, and how it is spread around the world. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there will be many, many questions uh, for Scott after his presentation. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping as always. Um, these are the rules of the, of the webinar, some of you know, uh, but I, I repeat them for the new ones. Um, after I make this introduction, Scott will show his presentation. Uh, we will mute every microphone and you know hide every camera. So please keep both that way so everyone can follow the speaker and the and the presentation. And of course, you can always send uh, questions uh, at any time by dropping us a message through the chat function that you see uh, on your screen. Um, I will pass as many questions to Scott as possible. Uh, I mean, the webinar will be finishing around uh, two thirty. Uh, uh, UK time, more or less. Um, so, without uh, further ado, uh, Scott, our virtual floor is yours. Thanks. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Eduardo. And uh, it's, I guess, nice to be speaking to you all um, in, this, in this way. So, um, I'm a research fellow here at the Reuters Institute, where I lead research uh, for the Oxford Martin Program on Misinformation Science and Media. And this is a joint project between the Reuters Institute the Oxford Internet Institute and the Oxford Martin School. And broadly put, the program explores the production and circulation of misinformation concerning science, technology, and health. Okay, now I'm not gonna name any names, but um, on March 8th, I received this email about the coronavirus from one of my family members. And this relative of mine wrote, just got this uh, from a friend, it's worth reading, exclamation mark. And, and then they copied in the text from the included forward, uh, which is a PDF, uh, which claimed to be from a friend's brother-in-law uh, brother living in China. And it says, Tom's a retired dentist currently dealing with cancer. I trust his medical judgment, which as a side note is this in itself is a pretty interesting statement about the types of expertise that matter here. But this email also provides 10 ways to treat or prevent COVID and then describes some symptoms of, of COVID to help you identify if you have it. Now, I'd wager that some of you out there recognize this email. You see, my relative wasn't the only one to share this. It has, in fact, been spread all over the world. Uh, more often, it is described as being advice from someone's uncle rather than from a friend's brother-in-law. But it has also been debunked by several different fact-checking outlets, including Snopes in the US and the British-based outlet uh, Full Fact. Now, both outlets observe that the claims here may seem reasonable but are either a bit off or they include details that are not based in fact or any sort of scientific evidence. So for example, uh, it includes the very reasonable suggestion to wash your hands frequently, that's number eight. But it also includes statements like number three, this new virus is not heat resistant and it will be killed by a temperature of just 26 or 27 degrees. It hates the sun. So there's little evidence of this, right? And certainly 27 degrees, which is cooler than body temperature, is very likely not hot enough to actually kill the virus. So I've chose to begin with this example, not only to poke a little fun at my relatives, but also because this shows something of the scale of the problem. Information about COVID-19 is everywhere, in news, on social media, and in email correspondence with aging family members. But also as news and information about the pandemic saturates our lives, so does misinformation. Now, as I'm sure you all are aware, the WHO announced back at the beginning of February, that as the virus spreads around the world, we face what they have called an infodemic, which they describe in this way as an overabundance of information, some accurate, some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy, trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. Which is to say, this infodemic involves a great deal of mis and disinformation about the virus. Now, I'm sure that you all have seen a number of different fact checks 
facts, news stories, commentaries, and discussions about coronavirus misinformation. It seems to be everywhere. And so, well, last month, we realized that despite this growing recognition of the problem, we still lacked a systematic understanding of all of this misinformation. We had a systematic account of questions like, you know, what does this misinformation look like? Right? Who is spreading it? Uh, what claims predominate? And how have the platforms responded? And these are, in really kind of broad terms, the questions that animate this study that I'll, that I'll be discussing today. Now, to address these questions, right, we first needed a set of misinformation to study. And this is actually somewhat difficult, right? I and mean, we certainly didn't want to put ourselves in a position where we would have to assess the validity of content ourselves. And so what we did is we went to existing fact checks by independent organizations. So the, the, uh, the nonprofit First Draft gave us access to a database that they maintain that collects fact checks from international, uh, uh, the International Fact Checking Network and Google Fact Checking Tools. And we sampled about 20%, a little less than 20% of all the English language fact checks through the end of March, from January, February, March. And this gave us a sample of about 225 pieces of misinformation. We then completed a systematic analysis of this set of pieces of misinformation, coding each for a number of different variables, uh, including the type, of the type of misinformation, the sorts of claims made, and the responses by social media. And I'll be talking about all that in a minute. We also gathered engagement data where it was available uh, of the social media posts in, in the sample to get an idea of how it was spreading, or at least how widely some of these claims were spreading. Now, I've intentionally kept the, the methods kind of discussion a bit brief, but I'm more, more than happy to go more in depth on, on exactly what we did at the end during the questions, if there are any sort of remaining questions. But that being said, there is one thing that I do want to, uh, one bit of clarification. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with the distinction that is often made between misinformation and disinformation, right? People often distinguish right, between disinformation, which is defined as false content that is knowingly circulated to deceive, and misinformation that is mistakenly so, or unintentionally spread. So this is an incredibly useful distinction, for sure. Uh, but here we realized that we were often unable to know for sure, right, if a person uh, spread a false claim intentionally to deceive, or because they thought it was actually the truth. And so in this report we use, and, and today I'm, I'm going to go ahead and use just the word misinformation to refer to any sort of false information. So I want to focus my time today on five key findings from our research. And these findings together provide some insight into the scale of the problem, the sources of misinformation out there in the world, the form or formats that that misinformation takes, the types of claims made, and uh, uh, the responses, the response by platforms to COVID-19 misinformation. So first, scale. So really simply put, the number of fact checks about COVID-19 increased radically from January to March. So about a 900% increase. Uh, this figure is, is actually, actually shows the entire corpus um, of English language fact checks from which we pulled our, our sample of, of 225. Uh, it's, it's about uh, 1,200 shown here. Now, right, of course, this isn't terribly surprising, right, if you've been paying attention. Uh, you know, to the news, um, right? And, and it shows pretty convincingly that fact checkers radically increased the number of claims about COVID-19 that, that they were fact checking. And, you know, while this is important in itself, what we really want to know, though, is does this mean that the amount of misinformation about COVID-19 has also increased? And the answer I can only give is probably, although we need to recognize the limits of the data, these data that we, that we have here. You know, fact checkers do not take a random sample of the content in the world to verify. Instead, they make very intentional decisions about what and what kinds of content you know, that they choose to, to validate. And so it is very likely that given the scope of what's happening, fact checking organizations have specifically decided to devote most of their resources to addressing COVID-19 misinformation. That being said, the fact that outlets continue to do so and that they continue to find new pieces to, to validate does indicate, you know, say, the large qu uh, quantity of misinformation circulating. And this certainly right, aligns with what I think we've all seen anecdotally and what many news outlets have been reporting, that there has, in fact, been this massive increase in misinformation about the virus. Okay, so we know that there's probably 
a lot of it. But what we say about who is spreading misinformation? Now, the first thing we can say, and this is pretty obvious, but we saw evidence that misinformation is coming both from the bottom up and from the top down, both from regular people, people, you know, mostly on social media, but also from prominent figures across platforms and, and media. That being said, prominent people produced or spread about 20% of the pieces of misinformation in the sample. And this ranges right from reality TV stars, influencers, actors, tech entrepreneurs, to politicians. And of course, certain politicians have recently received a great deal of media attention and scrutiny for their role in spreading misinformation about the virus. Now, again, I, I do need to stress that fact checkers are not randomly sampling misinformation in the wild. I know I already said that, but I'm going to repeat it. I, there's reason to believe that some outlets feel that there's value right in fact checking the claims of prominent people, especially politicians. Okay, that being said, we did look at the social media engagement of the pieces of, you know, of, the, of, of, of many of the pieces of content spread by these prominent people. And the content shared by prominent people accounts for 69% of the total engagements, right? In, in that's in this sample that we had data for. Um, so that's to say that prominent people form a small percentage of the misinformation, right? And that's mindful of the possibility that they are, you know, overrepresented, but they account for a large percentage of the total engagements. Right? I'll also say, right, our data don't include the reach of news articles or TV coverage. And indeed, we saw that about a third of the pieces of misinformation from prominent people. Uh, we're not on social media, but we're, we're on TV, which of course can have an extremely large reach and is likely serving as an important channel of this type of, of misinformation from prominent people. So another interesting finding here about the sources of misinformation is how little of the misinformation appears to be intended to generate a profit. So, right, it, it's quite difficult to assess the motivation behind a piece of misinformation right? just from looking at you know piece of content however we found that about four percent of uh our of, of articles in our sample or content or sample were posted on advertising heavy websites meant to just generate clicks and only about three percent uh, were obviously linked to supposed cures or you know preventatives or products for example like this this content from facebook advertising uh, colloidal silver uh, yeah, in nature's antibiotic. So I think we found this really quite surprising, right? Uh, we had assumed that there would be a huge amount of this sort of junk content circulating. Um, and it, it's worth noting that it may in fact exist. Again, we can only see what fact checkers chose to address. And it could be that fact checkers are, for whatever reason, not addressing it, or that platforms are catching it very quickly. So, okay, so we know that there's a lot of it. And we know that politicians and celebrities have disproportionate influence in spreading it. But what does this information actually look like? What form does it take? Now, over the past few years, scholars have identified a number of different types of mis and disinformation. And you know, different scholars have offered different ways of categorizing it. Now, rather than reinvent the wheel, we chose to apply a typology that has gotten quite a bit of, a, of attention lately. And this is from Claire Wardle at First Draft. Um, she offers this typology that lays out seven different types of content, and, and here they are. Satire parody, misleading content, imposter content, fabricated content, false connection, false content related content. Um, I won't go into how, what exactly these are, all are uh, right now, but again, we can come back to that in questions um, at the end. And then analyzing our sample, we coded our 225 pieces of misinformation according to these seven types, in addition to the other analyses that we did. Now, when we look at the results, there are, there are two things that I wanna highlight here. First, we have these seven categories, but we realize that we can collapse them down really into just two different types of content. We're actually gonna kind of put satire and parody to the side for the moment. So we have these two different types of content. That which is completely fabricated, completely made up, and that which is what we call reconfigured, in which a fact or a grain of truth has been twisted, manipulated, or recontextualized in a way that it is no longer true. So when we did that, when we collapsed these seven categories down into these two different types, we found that 59% of the pieces of content in our sample were what we call reconfigured. Now, a good example of this type of thing 
is of course that piece that I began with from my from my relative, right? Where each of those recommendations and discussions of the symptom of the virus are just a little bit off, right? So just another example from that from that email uh, says, uh, if you have a runny nose and sputum, you have a common cold and not the coronavirus. As full fact noted when they when they fact check it, right? This while this isn't really the most common way that COVID nineteen presents, there are certainly people for whom these are the, the first symptoms. But this large category of reconfigured content also includes pieces uh, like, like this that show a picture or a video but claim it's something else. And, and here's an example uh, with some very odd music. So. so this video supposedly shows hundreds of crows appearing in Wuhan uh, during the worst parts of the outbreak. And uh, uh, on, on Facebook, this, this spread widely, but on Facebook, uh, this post, I had tagged it with, uh, a truly disturbing number of crows have descended into Wuhan, China. What could be attracting so many? Hundreds of people die all the time. Their city is bigger than New York. No, what's happening here is much bigger and darker. In fact, this video is not from Wuhan, but it's from another city, a thousand miles to the Northwest Wuhan, and right, the crows, have really nothing to do with the outbreak whatsoever. So here's another example that was uh, shared widely, uh, which claims to show victims of the virus being buried in a mass grave. This is actually from the film Contagion. So what do we make of this prominence of reconfigured content? Well, we have pretty limited data on this, admittedly, but there's certainly reason to wonder if this sort of reconfigured or you know, recontextualized or, or twisted content may be harder for the public to recognize or harder, or take more time at least, for organizations to fact check, right? Because it can often disentangling the truth from falsehoods in complicated ways. There's also reason to worry that it may be sort of more convincing and more compelling. And notably, our data do show that reconfigured content had on the whole significantly more engagement on social media than wholly fabricated content. That is, it seems that reconfigured content spread more widely than completely fabricated content. Now, the second thing that I wanna say about formats, the format of misinformation, is that we saw a small amount of manipulated content. This involves videos or images that had been altered. We saw about 6%, no, 6% of the corpus involved this. Now, manipulated content is one of those seven original types of misinformation, right, from, from the typology that we used. But of course, right, we also included in this, in this lar that larger grouping of reconfigured content for, for obvious reasons. Now, I'm sure many of you will know that there has been a great deal of concern recently about AI-based tools for creating or manipulating content, most famously deepfakes. And if you remember, here's that video that Jordan Peele helped make uh, of, of President uh, Obama. And I'll go ahead and play this. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. But what's interesting is all of the manipulated content that we saw in our sample used really simple photo or video, video editing techniques that have, have existed nearly as long as there has been video or photographs, right? What some others, uh, I think scholars from the Data and Society first called cheap fakes. Now here's an example I'm going to share. It's a little bit longer, uh, and I want to see if uh, see if you can identify what has been modified. Scientists from the University of Queensland are confident they'll be able to develop a vaccine for the deadly coronavirus. The university has been asked by the Coalition for Epidemic preparedness innovations to develop a vaccine using UQ's recently developed rapid response technology. Beginning is from an Australian news segment. And the creators of, of this piece of misinformation added in these images of bananas and clips from other news outlets 
in order to suggest that big bananas hold the answer to, to coronavirus. Now, I, I have no idea why they would do this. Um, but the is that this video is sort of indicative of the types of manipulated content that we saw, right? They're, they're a lot more simpler than we might have guessed. And it suggests that at least as of yet, AI-based tools like deepfakes are, are still very rare. All right, so we know something about who's spreading it, about what form it takes, but what about what the misinformation actually says, right? What about the claims that are made? So we inductively coded our sample for the sorts of claims that they contained. Now, what this means is that we used the pieces of misinformation themselves to help identify the types of claims, which we re refined over several rounds of coding. And this is what we found. Um, and so I'll just say really quick that individual pieces of misinformation in our sample were coded as often containing multiple different, different of these claims, which is why the numbers don't add up to 100. Now, there's a lot to, we could talk, say about this, this slide, but I want to just focus on the first bar. Uh, and I'll say that this might have been the most surprising finding, at least for me, that the most common claim in these pieces of misinformation had to do with actions and policies of public authorities, right, including governments or international organizations like the WHO or the UN. And this includes such claim, claims such as uh, this one from March 14th um, that not only impersonated the Florida Department of Health, but claimed that there was a lockdown. And this is before there was a lockdown in, in Florida. Or this one about the Chinese government enacting a policy of killing patients to, to uh, sp uh, prevent the spread of the virus. Now, it's important to remember that this material may be sort of low-hanging fruit for fact checkers. It may be that fact checkers right, find that these sorts of claims really kind of you know, easy to validate, or frankly, that they think that it's really important right, that they spend their time fact checking these sorts, of, these sorts of claims. And that could be why they're so common in the sample. That being said, um, that so many of the pieces of misinformation in our sample contain these sorts of claims may suggest a few things. First, uh, public authorities may not always succeed right, in providing clear, useful, and trusted information. In the absence of sufficient information, misinformation about these topics may sort of fill in the gaps in public understanding. That the second most common claim, or let's talk, let's talk for a second, uh, concerns the spread of the virus in the community, right? Another type of information usually provided by public authorities only kind of further underscores this point. But this finding also underscores the broader crisis of trust in public institutions that has, of course, been very well documented and, and talked about. And it could be animating in different ways a large amount of the misinformation about those public authorities. Now, at the same time, this finding could point to the growing politicalization of the pandemic and the response as well, right? In which misinformation directed at or about public authorities is seen as strategically advantageous, right, for certain political actors. And finally, this finding also highlights just fundamentally the important role that independent fact checkers can play in public discussion, right? If many claims concern, uh, you know, critiques of public authorities or cast public authorities in a sort of negative light, uh, those institutions may run into problems trying to fact check for those claims. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we continue to have independent fact checkers doing this sort of work. Okay, so the final uh, finding that I'll discuss uh, today concerns how platforms have responded to, to uh, misinformation, this piece of misinformation. Now, the different platforms have been approaching COVID-19 misinformation in different ways. And uh, importantly, it should be noted that a lot of what happens actually kind of goes on behind the scenes in terms of deep ranking and deep prioritizing certain content and feeds or in search. But also now many platforms try to direct users to reliable information sources. So just a couple of examples, this is a, a pinned uh, post on, on Reddit, directing people to a, a coronavirus subreddit, uh, or this is the uh, coronavirus information center from Facebook, which you see links to all, all around Facebook. But in some cases, platforms will also remove uh, misleading content altogether. And of course, it's important to remember that different platforms have different policies about this, right? About the sorts of content that raised to the level of being, needing to be removed. This is, uh, you know, you do. 
Uh, finally, Facebook notably also now labels some of their content with, with this label. Um, and it says that a piece is false information is, is, is checked by independent fact checkers. Now, given the sorts of responses, I wanted to know first just how many pieces on social media identified and validated by fact checkers were still active and accessible, right, without any sort of indication that they were false. That is to say, right, in the face of case, uh, Facebook, at least, how many did not have a warning label but were still, were still around? And, and this is what we found. So this chart shows the percentage of posts still available on platforms, and in the case of Facebook, those that do not have a warning label, right? And, and we, this data comes from, uh, you know, the beginning of April. I'll just say it's very possible that between then and now, some of these posts have been taken down or, or labeled. But we saw that 59% of tweets specifically identified by fact checkers in the sample are still, are still available. Um, and of course, we should stress that um, many of those that are available on Twitter uh, um, and, and Facebook, or excuse me, that are not available on Twitter and Facebook, I may have actually not only been removed by the platforms, but could have been removed by the original poster. So we saw 27 still available on YouTube and 24 still posted without a warning label on, on Facebook. Okay, so we've looked at these five areas, the scale of the problem, the sources that are spreading misinformation, the format misinformation takes, the claims it involves, and the response by social platforms. And taken together, we believe this provides some initial insight to the shape of misinformation about the pandemic and the response. And I, and I wanna just end on two additional observations. So first, in addition to providing insight into misinformation, this study also says something about fact checking. And as I already mentioned, our findings you know, underscore the important role that independent fact checkers can play in public discussion. The thing to remember is that fact checking is a scarce resource and many fact checking organizations are doing the best they can with too few people, too little time and too few resources. Our data hint that many fact checkers are now devoting most if, you know, or many if not most of their resources to coronavirus related content. But just because there's more misinformation about coronavirus doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't still other types of misinformation out there that could or should be fact-checked. On one hand, it's even more important than usual that fact-checkers collaborate, right, to limit overlapping in, in what they fact-check, to better distribute those very limited resources and limit the number of pieces of misinformation fact-checked by multiple outlets. But also, as, as fact-checkers like news outlets may be entering very difficult times in terms of funding, I just want to stress how essential it is that funders continue to recognize how important fact-checking is and continue to support this work. Finally, I want to return to the term infodemic. So, um, now, since February, this term has spread widely right, as a description of the problem of misinformation that we face. And while it certainly captures the scale of the problem, right, how misinformation about COVID-19 is spreading widely, our findings suggest that it perhaps mischaracterizes the nature of the problem. Right? When we put our findings together, we see that there is this wide variety in the types of misinformation circulating, the claims made uh, concerning the virus, the motivations behind its production. Unlike the pandemic itself, there is no single root cause behind the spread of misinformation about the coronavirus, right? You know, behind this infodemic. Instead, COVID-19 appears to be supplying the opportunity for very different actors with a range of different motivations and goals uh, to produce a variety of types of misinformation about you know, many different topics. In this sense, uh, misinformation about COVID-19 is as diverse as the information about it. The risk in not recognizing the diversity in the landscape of coronavirus misinformation is assuming that there could be a single solution to this set of problems. Instead, our findings suggest that there will be no silver bullet or inoculation, no cure for misinformation about the coronavirus, right? There's, there's no banana. Uh, instead, addressing the spread of misinformation about COVID-19 will take a sustained and coordinated effort by independent fact checkers, independent news media, platform companies, and public authorities to help the public understand and navigate the, the pandemic. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much. And I, I am excited to see your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, listen to you. Um, and I'm sure everyone can, can relate to that kind of message from, 
from an ankle. Everyone has received something similar during this crisis and, and I'm sure there will be many, many questions about that. Well, we have a few questions now. Uh, the first one is from uh, Ted Sullivan. And here's the question. How do fact checkers attempt to differentiate between what may be honest differences of opinion between experts dealing with COVID-19? And what do we know about medical personnel dealing with the outbreak uh, or the getting the information? Do they pay any attention to claims being made in the general media? Um, sorry, you actually cut out there for a second, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the text okay. of the question. Um, You know, um, I actually, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna have to punt on this question. I mean, I um, probably in the audience today, I imagine there, there might be fact checkers. So if anyone wants to, any fact checker wants to, to, to speak up and answer this, I would, I would much rather def defer to you. I'm not a fact checker. I've never worked as a fact checker. And um, I certainly don't want to get, you know, uh, um, get ahead of my skis. If that's a, that, that analogy makes any, makes any sense. And I would certainly hate to describe fact checking in a way that, that is not accurate. So, so sorry. There's also this other question. I think it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm not sure if we have any data on this, but, but about the medical personnel that right now they are dealing with a virus that is a new virus. Uh, so, so they don't have you know, certainties as, as, they, as they do for other diseases. Uh, do we know anything about how they get informed? How the, how the, the experts or the fact checkers? Yeah, no, the, the experts, the medical, oh. the doctors, the nurses, yeah. I mean, sure, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. Like, the fact that, you know, often these conversations about misinformation, like, kind of presume that there is accurate and clear and true information, and it's really clear what that, you know, what the difference between the, those is. And, um, I mean, I think the, the, your, your point is, is absolutely right, that here in the situation well, where that's not really the case, and there's a great deal of information out there about, about COVID-19 that we don't know. And, you know, the, the consensus and the findings are changing all the time. And this certainly does raise problems for fact checkers or really for all of us trying to sort out what is, what is true and what's not. Uh, Yes, definitely. It's a, it's a problem that everyone is, is, uh, is going through. Um, we have a question from Andy Cotgrave, uh, and he's asking, how do we keep track of our own biases? For example, a left-leaning Democrat might, edit, might identify a piece of content as misinformation that a right-leaning Republican might define as truth. Um, this seems especially true of misinterpretation types of misinformation as the ones you presented, Scott. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. And I think it just sort of highlights the difficult and important work that fact checkers do. Um, you know, there are a number of very good, uh, uh, rigorous fact checking organizations out there that have strong sort of, you know, norms and procedures to try and be as objective as, as possible. And Fact, you know, the best fact checkers, you know, consider themselves or think about themselves as the same way that journalists do. And they try to sort of get away from, you know, the obvious biases and actually, you know, uh, um, you know, assess pieces of content as a, you know, by appealing to the best available evidence. But you're absolutely right that like these distinctions between what is true and what is false are really, really tricky and, and absolutely you know, this finding that most of the, you know, the majority of content is this sort of reconfigured, you know, a big chunk of that, if you remember back to the, to the slide, is, is uh, um, you know, the misleading content, which you're, you're absolutely right to point out, it can just be sort of, mis, you know, mi sort of misstated or slightly kind of bent uh, claims. And, and it, yeah, super difficult. Yeah, it is super, super tricky. Um, another question from Tiffany Cassidy. Uh, she's asking actually about the bananas video, which is, as she said, very, very absurd. So, so when you see videos like this, do you have any guesses about why they were made? Because, you know, there's probably no, no profit motive in anything yeah. like this, I guess. It's not, a, it's, it's not a factory of bananas or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, it could be the, uh, I don't know, the banana, <laughs> the banana cartel. I don't know. But um, I mean, my, my guess is uh, someone is just trolling. Right. I mean, um, that is a huge source of misinformation, um, you know, uh, and, I'll, and I'll just point out, uh, uh, there's been some just amazing work done uh, by uh, Whitney Phillips on, on trolling as a sort of uh, 
phenomenon and an approach, <laughs> um, uh, you know, in, in, as it relates to on, online communities and misinformation. And I think uh, some of this misinformation is certainly just people just trying to, to, to do it for the lols, right? Just ha having fun. And I, and I assume that's what's going on with the banana video. But I mean, um, I mean, there, there's a whole other sort of discussion here, this thing we could have about how there is this sort of um, uh, conversation going on about how uh, the, the virus, you know, some of these kind of uh, community, uh, conspiracy communities about how the virus is actually less important than the immune system response. And so it's possible that, that plays into to all of that. But, but uh, that, that's about as all, all I can say about, about that video. Yeah, now that you mentioned uh, Whitney Phillips, uh, she's, she's the author of a very interesting report, I think a couple of years ago, uh, called The Oxygen of Amplification. And I think it's, it's very interesting. It's, I think it, it would be worth uh, you uh, telling us how do you see uh, that kind of uh, debate. I mean, the debate on um, how fact checkers or how journalists should deal with this kind of conspiracy theories and, and the debate about amplifying them when fact checking them or actually, you know, what, what what should we do as journalists? How do you see that, Scott? Mm. Yeah, you asked me, a, that's a really difficult question. I wish I had an answer for that. That was, you know, better than it's a really complicated question, right? Um, uh, you know, I do believe that it is, it is uh, it, you know, it is important for there to be space in public discussion for people to be wrong and for there to be ideas that are non-mainstream, that are not part of the mainstream. And it is, I think, important for journalists to cover them, and to cover those ideas. Obviously, there are limits. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, um, I, you know, yeah, th I mean, this is one of those key questions that, you know, academics, uh, journalists, and, 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 and a lot of other people are really grappling with. What, what, what is the best thing to do? And, and uh, I, all I can say is that it's an ongoing discussion. Sure. Yeah, it's a super tricky dilemma, so, so I understand how difficult it is to respond. Um, we have another question from King Paul Green. Um, uh, the question, any ideas on how we can inoculate the very well-chosen word, school children against uh, fake news or misinformation by teaching them uh, to think about the problems logically? Um, I mean, I can just offer what, what's on the top of my head, but, you know, I, so this is the problem with studying misinformation is that I, I feel like a, a, I need to be very careful on what I say as far as, um, you know, I, we did this study and I can speak to the findings of this study, um, but, you know, spending all this time, you know, studying misinformation, I, I just, I'm, I want to be very, very careful not to, tr you know, make claims that I can't root in empirical evidence. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I wish I did. I mean, there's some great research being done on just this question and the importance of media training and media literacy. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, I, I could just sort of point, point you to, to some of that research. I'll also say there's some really interesting discussion about how, um, and I'm, I'm very sorry to say this, but some of that media training might backfire in some cases, that there are certainly communities online of people who believe that they are being critical media consumers when they don't trust what they are being told by 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 authorities um so there have been some suggestions that that um some of that media training may actually backfire in certain situations which is why i'm sort of hesitant to to, to offer any, any specific advice so. Also, some of the data says that, uh, you know, the older people are actually more vulnerable to some of these things, right? Yeah, right. Like my relative, right, who, who, <laughs> who, who sent the, the email that I started with, right? I mean, that, I think that's, um, and that's been one of the Reuters findings, um, that, that uh, you know, yeah, that, that older people are, are a huge uh, um, source of, of shares of misinformation as well. Uh, a question from Thomas Graham. Uh, he's asking, has similar research has been uh, done looking at misinformation on Chinese social media, as far as you know, Scott? Um, I don't know of anything that's been published. Um, I know of something in progress, um, but I, I don't, it's, it's very possible that it has, but, I, but I'm not sure. So, yeah. But it would be really interesting to, to, see, to see that. Um, a question from Daniel Ratza. Uh, he's asking, are you aware of any research uh, trying to locate the source of misinformation regarding the action of public authorities? 
for example, often shared WhatsApp messages about locking down entire cities mm -hmm. and imposing uh, curfews. That was very common in Poland, for instance, he's saying. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, no, no. I mean, the thing we have to remember is that, you know, well, yes and no, I guess. So, you know, this is all really new and research takes, you know, often a long time. And, and uh, so there aren't that many studies yet about, you know, about uh, misinformation about, about, the, about the virus. I will say, uh, I'll point you to the work of, um, there's the, the arm of the, uh, the EU, the, uh, of the EEA, EEAS, the EU versus disinformation team. And they have been focusing really uh, quite heavily on um, state-backed disinformation, especially in Eastern Europe. And a lot of what they look at is takes this sort of form about explicit attacks on public authorities. And what they, what they look at, right, is state-backed things, right? Disinformation uh, in, the, in the truest sense of the word, right? Uh, um, pieces of content that are intended to, to uh, foment uh, unrest and distrust in, in public institutions. Um, so that is certainly a, you know, a, 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 an aspect of it. I will also say though, in our sample, we didn't see much of that that was at least identified as such by the fact checkers. And this is the problem, right, of relying on fact checkers, right? You know, we didn't have the capacity to try and assess like each piece of content if it came from a state-backed source. But the fact checkers in our sample did not identify m much of that sort of content in our sample. We have a question from uh, my good friend, uh, Ramon Salaverria, uh, professor at the University of Navarra in Spain. And Ramon is asking, um, you have research about English speaking uh, misinformation um, as English language is obviously used in many different countries, have you any evidence uh, of, of the countries or the regions where misinformation is, is, is produced right now is, or is more prevalent, uh, at least in terms of production? I don't know about COVID, maybe, 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 maybe research about other kinds of misinformation before that you have seen, Scott. Yeah, uh, so, so I'll say, yeah, we, we only looked at English language fact checks. Um, and, and this is where it gets kind of tricky. So. Um, some of the content, the misinformation content was actually not English, but the fact checks were written in English. Uh, so we do actually include some non-English misinformation content um, in, in, in the sample. Um, but um, I mean, so yeah, but, but you're right. Like I can't really offer you any sort of reliable country comparison. And that's because, right, the, the sample is, I wouldn't say it's any sort of like sy systematic sample as far as the different countries are concerned and, and the, the countries that are represented in our sample are heavily skewed towards the US and to India just because there's a lot of fact checkers I, I would guess there's a lot of fact checkers operating in, in those countries um, you know yeah I can, I can point you to I mean I guess just some of the work that Reuters has done but also a, a lot that's going on at, at the uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it but over at, over at Comprop uh, team at the Oxford Internet Institute that they've really been doing a, a, a great deal of work about international misinformation uh, especially with their election observatory work where they look at the misinformation disinformation circulating around different uh, elections over the past few years um, so I, I, would, I would point you to that. Um, the next question is a bit tricky. It's from Jonathan uh, Zilberman, and he's asking, um, once, we, uh, once a piece of information has been identified as misinformation, is there a protocol uh, to prevent it from being circulated or aware uh, the general public to the existence of this piece of misinformation? I guess it's a question uh, about how to stop it, and, and it's, it's, it's a very tricky one, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um... So, I mean, yeah, yes, um, in, in, at least as it concerns the platforms. And I mean, this is sort of at the heart of a lot of the, uh, well, one of the legs of a lot of the platform's uh, uh, policy response to this type of misinformation. And I think the kind of most m notable sort of example of this is um, Facebook actually has an explicit relationship with a number of different fact-checking organizations around the world. And as part of this agreement, these different fact checkers agree to fact check content pulled from Facebook. 
and I believe uh, that they're sort of given special access to, to metrics and, and uh, they, they can sort of see the post that the Facebook algorithms have sort of identified as either spreading widely or, or might, I think, be uh, uh, suspect. Uh, once they have been identified, I, Facebook then labels them or removes them while also, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, doing a lot of things sort of behind the scenes about, about deprioritizing the news feeds and, and, and otherwise. So I think the, you know, but your question I know is it's a little bit more general about this sort of protocol and, you know, and, and but I think platforms are aware that that's really happening. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not quite sure who else would, you know, be, I mean, I, I suppose there, there might, there could be a role for like government to get into that, but uh, um, no, there, there isn't really. Well, there's also another kind of problem, I guess, Scott, which is, you know, many of these uh, pieces of misinformation are traveling through through places like WhatsApp, and we don't have access actually to the content itself, right? Right. No, absolutely. I mean, WhatsApp is the huge is a huge is a huge problem. Um, unfortunately, uh, in our study, in our sample, there are very few pieces of misinformation from WhatsApp, and that's because it's really hard for fact checkers to get access to what's circulating on WhatsApp. Some uh, fact checking organizations are, are, have come up with you know, smart ideas about, they have like, a, um, we call it like helplines where people can forward messages that they receive and ask them to be fact checked or validated. And that's where I think you know, the, the content is coming from um, for the most part, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, and, and certainly there is some worry about the, proposed changes, the announced changes for Facebook, the direction that Facebook is heading, right, is, is only going to make that a little bit, uh, yeah, maybe more difficult kind of moving forward, for sure. Yeah, that's that's totally true. And, and actually, I mean, I have a small data point from Maldita, which is the Spanish fact checker. They are receiving right now 2,000 claims every day through the WhatsApp headline that they have, 2,000 a day. So that gives you an idea of how, how difficult it is for them to actually meet the demand. Um, a, a question from Catriona O'Sullivan. Um, she said, um, misinformation and disinformation uh, are filling a gap in knowledge. Um, so, so there is a thirst uh, for knowledge, especially during uncertainty. And it hints uh, to the idea that it is, uh, there is a failing on the part of public institutions uh, in their communication strategy. Do you agree with that? Um, so do I agree that, that there's an existing thirst for more information? Uh, and also, I mean, I guess what Catriona is, is saying is, you know, that, 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 that there is here is a failing. I don't know if it's uh, because of the uncertainty of the virus, but, but if no. there is a failing on the part of the, of the public institutions, they're not communicating um, as, as, as well as they should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, yes, I, I think I would, I, I think I would, I would feel comfortable saying that. I mean, um, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I think a lot, all of us, right, are certainly very interested to uh, have access to clear, reliable information about what's going on. And it's certainly incredibly important. And, and uh, you know, so, some of the, the you know, so, so the re research uh, published by Reuters actually about news use has really just shown how, how much that is the case, right? How, how people are, you know, really seeking out information about, about the virus and, 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 and about the pandemic. Um, and, and sure, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of overstate that finding that like the problem here is that public authorities are not doing a good enough job. Like that does not sort of sum up the problem. However, I, I do think that they could have done a better, certain public authorities could have done a better job at certain times during, during all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the super interesting. Um, we're almost uh, finishing right now, but there's also another question from Miko. It's kind of a question, also a comment, I mean, about how to stop this kind of misinformation uh, and, and how uh, the European Union in this case can work with some of these platforms. Uh, I don't know, I mean, we haven't talked about the kind of policy response that we can, that we can actually enact uh, to, to, to stop misinformation. And I guess it is, you know, any, any response, has, response has to involve, you know, people like platforms, uh, media organization, but also the government. I don't know if you have, you know, studied that and you have a view on this, Scott. Yeah, I mean, I certainly have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I think uh, probably best if I, if I, uh, you know, don't, don't go too much into that. 
just at the you know for the for the interest of staying really close to the to the data here. But I think you're absolutely right, and it points to just how difficult and complex this is, that it does take, I mean, and, and this is sort of where I ended the presentation, that it does take this coordinated response, right? Not only of platforms, but but of, of different, you know, other public authorities, governments and international authorities as well. And uh, it's, it's a really difficult set of problems, uh, for sure. Another kind of question related to that one is, uh, you know, we've seen a very different reaction this time from the platforms uh, in terms of misinformation. Uh, you know, platforms taking down, you know, things like speeches by Jair Bolsonaro, the Brazilian president, um, also sharing public, uh, you know, the message uh, of public authorities, you know, healthcare messages uh, and so on. Uh, so do we, we, do we know if those uh, kind of reactions have had any impact um, so far? And, you know, why do you think they have been such so proactive uh, this time and, and not so much, you know, in, in, you know, during the 2016 American election or during Brexit and other, and on other occasions? Yeah, um, well, that's a, okay. So there, there's a couple questions there. So first about the impact, um, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's pretty early to tell. I mean, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, assessing the impact of these sorts of things is really, really hard, as it is assessing the impact of misinformation more generally. And like, this is, you know, the, yeah, this is the challenge. Like, th this is the, 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 the key question in all of this misinformation research that everyone wants to know, and it's like the hardest thing to, to actually assess. But the same is true of like the, the strategies to sort of try and approach it. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that the, if you ask the platforms, they would say that, that they've been incredibly successful and it has made a huge difference. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think we'll, we'll see what the research kind of holds down the line. Um, the other sort of question about like why they are reacting a little bit more aggressively. Again, I don't want to speak too much for the platforms, but, you know, I think it's um, and, and uh, that well, this may change, right? As the political situation changes a little bit, but but I think it's 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 an easy it's it's an easy thing, right, for the platforms to be against misinform misinformation about COVID nineteen, right? It doesn't, at least initially, didn't have some of the same sort of political uh, um, me messiness, right? And, and in fact, it should it should be a, you know sort of a lay a layup for platforms, right? You. Um, you know, at, at least at first, right? You you have a, a body of international authorities, experts that you can point to and say, like, this is, you know, maybe the evidence and the information about the virus is changing constantly, but at least, like, here are respected international authorities, and we can we can in you know we we can use that as a sort of guidepost for what is you know at least for you know for now right and and, and wrong. Um, and yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I think at the same time, you know, the platforms have learned quite a bit uh, since 2016. And certainly since 2016, they have spent, you know, four years um, thinking about, you know, what went wrong and, 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 trying, and trying to do better. Yes, and then there's no one on the side of the virus this time. So that's, that makes it easier, I guess. Yeah. Final question uh, from Thomas Graham. And, and it's kind of a cliffhanger, but I guess some of our uh, you know, listeners want to know, what will, be, what will you be exploring next with this kind of research on misinformation, Scott? Is there something that you're starting to look at? Uh, what are the things that would be very interesting, uh, do you think, to, you know, to understand better? In yeah, terms of uh, misinformation. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a great way to end. Um, so um, we will be doing a follow up report uh, in I think a you know tentatively planned for for three months. We're still figuring out what exactly that's going to look like. Um, to me, you know, and, and I'd hate to sort of like make promises that I can't that I can't live up to. But to me, you know, the most sort of one of the most sort of interesting questions from all this that we can't really address. Um, is really getting more information about who is sharing these pieces of misinformation and why. And that's really difficult, right? Like we tried to sort of assess something like motivation. We actually coded pieces according to a, like a typology of motivation and we didn't really report on it because it, it's, not, it's, it's super difficult. But I would love if we could come up with some kind of creative ways of learning more about the people actually sharing it. And, and uh, I mean, that goes to some of the questions that have been asked, right? Like, yeah, I would love to know why, why someone would take the hours required to edit in bananas into, you know, some news broadcast. 
Um, so that to me is, is what, what's, what's super interesting here. Of course, the other big question is, is the other thing we just talked about, impact. How can we assess impact? I mean, that is the, that is the key sort of question and, and uh, we're trying to come up with, with interesting ways to do that. And, and well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. It's been a real pleasure to, to listen to your presentation. Uh, finally, three things, as we always do, uh, do. First of all, thank you, everyone, for, for being with us today. We know how busy you are, how important your work is, um, especially journalists in the room. Thank you for your service. It's, it's really valuable in this kind of uncertainty and this, this really difficult time for everyone. Uh, second, uh, we will send you uh, an email with the video. Uh, of the presentation and also with the slides that the Scott has created for this. So uh, again, uh, we, I mean, we will send that later today. You will receive that. Uh, we will do another webinar next week, next uh, Thursday. Uh, we will be in touch, uh, you know, about the topic. And finally, of course, as we always say, wash your hands, uh, stay at home. Uh, if your government, uh, you know, is, is asking you to. And, um, you know, we hope that you really stay safe and sane in this kind of difficult, difficult situation. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll be in touch uh, for next week's uh, uh, webinar. Bye-bye.